We're so excited for tonight's program. We're celebrating Women's History Month. We're getting to the end of the month, and I think we're saving the best for last. Um, our own uh, Wheaton's first female mayor, Margaret Hamilton. Um, tonight's program is co-sponsored by the City of Wheaton Community Relations Commission and the Women League of Voters of Wheaton, who have just been both wonderful, wonderful partners uh, to the library. So I'm so um, honored to introduce first Rachel Bautista of the Community Relations Commission. Thank you, Courtney. So on behalf of the City of Wheaton Community Relations Commission, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. For those of you who are not familiar with the commission, we are a group of local volunteers and our purpose is to be a catalyst in the community to connect all people and make them feel united with Wheaton through events, key partnerships and opportunities to give back. And one of the ways we do this is by celebrating the Wheaton community. We are proud to co-sponsor tonight's event with the Wheaton Public Library and the League of Women Voters of Wheaton as we continue to celebrate Women's History Month. A little bit of background, but Margaret Hamilton was our inspiration for the events we have put on in celebration of Women's History Month. As you are about to learn, she was a true trailblazer who had an incredible impact on the community. And we recognize that she is one of the many other incredible women who have helped make Wheaton what it is today. So we want to continue to celebrate and recognize the contributions of some of the phenomenal women who make Wheaton such a wonderful place to live. And I encourage you to please visit the Women's History Month page, and I'll post a link in the chat, to learn about some of these amazing women of Wheaton and explore other events we'll have going on throughout the end of the month. Lastly, in addition to our Women's History Month efforts, we have launched our Good Citizens Award. We all know someone, a neighbor, a friend, a student, a local group who goes above and beyond for the community. So we encourage you to nominate them for a Good Citizens Award. I'll also leave a link in the chat where you can send your submission between now and April 26. Thank you again, and a special thank you to Bob Goldsboro for break, helping us to bring this program to life. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Judy Beaver from the Wheaton League of Women Voters. We're happy also to be partnering with the Wheaton Public Library and the Wheaton Community Relations Commission for this very special presentation about our founder of the Wheaton League of Women Voters and Wheaton's first female mayor as well, Margaret Hamilton. The League of Women Voters of Wheaton serves the communities of Carroll Stream, Warrenville, West Chicago, Wheaton, and Winfield. The League is a nonpartisan political organization and does not support or oppose any candidates for elected office. The League's mission is to defend democracy and um, empower voters. So please be sure to vote um, Tuesday, April 6th on local election day. And the Wheaton League's website helps you to learn about your candidates with our video voter guide and videos of the forums in our communities. Please check it out. I'll put the link in the chat as well. So enjoy the presentation and I'll send it back to Courtney. Thanks. Thanks so much, Judy and Rachel. You both have been just a pleasure to work with on, on this program. I am so, so excited to introduce Bob Goldsboro. Um, when we were planning this program, we wanted to do a program on Margaret Hamilton. And we're like, well, who, like, what could we do? Who could we ask? And we kind of asked around and it kept coming back to, to Bob Goldsboro. And I'm like, oh, why did I, how did I not think of Bob? Um, so he is a Wheaton resident, local history expert, um, and a journalist writer for the Chicago Tribune. Um, and he did some architectural presentations for the library and the historic commission a couple years ago on Jarvis Hunt and Edward Dart, which are fascinating, uh, highlighting some Wheaton houses. Those are available on our YouTube channel if you want to check them out. Um, so he also wrote Mark Hamilton's obituary and actually spent some time with her. So we're going to get some firsthand knowledge. So I'm so happy to introduce Bob Goldsboro. So Bob, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, Bob, I think you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm unmuted now. I apologize for that. Courtney, thank you so much. Thanks also to Rachel and thanks to Judy as well. It is a real privilege to be speaking to everyone about Margaret Hamilton. Um, she went by the nickname Margie. And if you look on my first slide, uh, which I don't know if it's up on the screen yet or not, uh, but it, they were, she was interchangeably called either Margaret or Mar Margie. Uh, it, the temptation was quite easy to call her Margie. Uh, since a number of people go by that name, but she was Margaret uh, Hamilton was her formal name and then her nickname was Margie. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about who she was. Uh, so it's just a pleasure to be partnering with the Wheaton Public Library and the Commission and the League on this. 
So um, Margie Hamilton, her time as mayor was not long. She was on the city as mayor for two years, but she spent 12 years in total on the Wheaton City Council. She was the first female city council member as well. And the years that she was on the council, those were seminal years uh, in Wheaton's development. The city very much modernized itself, moving from uh, an, a much smaller and less developed community to a much more modern one. Um, Margie, along the way, fought against discrimination in housing, and she really made Wheaton a leader in fair housing, which is sort of hard to imagine, but we'll get into more of that shortly. She also pushed for professionalization of the city's operating leadership. Up to that point, it's also hard to imagine, but members of the city council managed department heads themselves, and the city's development policies, to the extent that there really were any, were fairly slipshod. On top of that, she was a driving force behind the construction of the current Wheaton Public Library, the acquisition of the current City Hall building, and the creation of the Illinois Prairie Path. Later on in her career, uh, she left, so long after she was mayor, she left a strong legacy in the field of education and learning. So we go to the next slide. So a little bit of background about myself. So I moved to Wheaton in 1975. I grew up on the south side of town near Kelly Park, really close to where Margie's house was when she was mayor. I hadn't moved to Wheaton yet, but I, I lived very close to where she did. I went to Whittier and Edison and Wheaton Central, and then I earned uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees from several colleges and universities in Illinois. I've written for the Chicago Tribune now for 28 years. I've often covered Wheaton, and I've long taken a deep interest, keen interest in Wheaton history. So I've given a number of history talks, as Courtney mentioned over the years, including for the Wheaton Public Library, the Wheaton Historic Commission, the DuPage Historical Museum, Windermere, and some other organizations as well. Next slide. So I, I, as Courtney mentioned, I really had the privilege of getting to meet Margie on several occasions. I interviewed her for the Chicago Tribune over the years. I talked to her when she was 99. I talked to her on her 100th birthday as well in 2015, wrote an article about her attaining that milestone. And then I, as Courtney mentioned, I wrote a news obituary about her as well for the Tribune when she died in 2019. So I'll be sharing some of those um, elements of those interviews uh, during this talk. If you go to the next slide. So how on earth did Margie become Wheaton's first female mayor? And how do you become a female mayor in 1959? In the post-war years, so after World War II, Wheaton's political scene was incredibly insular. The Wheaton City Council had just five members on it, and it was very politically conservative. Uh, and for many Wheaton people, for many years, I feel like the idea of a woman mayor probably seemed as improbable as a talking lion. But as C.S. Lewis's wardrobe at Wheaton's own Marion E. Wade Center and the character of Aslan from C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe remind us, sometimes a whole new world can be just a step away. And that really was the case. Margie, where you're gonna hear in the next few minutes, if you go to the next slide, you'll hear in the next few minutes how 1950, Margie moved to Wheaton. By the time the 1950s ended, Wheaton had its first female city council member in Margie. By the end of the 1960s, even before a man set foot on the moon, she was Wheaton's mayor. So why don't we go back to the very beginning? Let's take a look at Margie's beginnings on Chicago's South Side. And these were humble beginnings. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you. She was born, Margie was born Margette Sipe in Chicago's South Shore neighborhood, down on the South Side, June 27, 1915. She grew up in an area of South Shore called Windsor Park. So she graduated from Bowen High School, which you can see below there. You can see earlier and later, more of a modern photo on the lower right. It's a gorgeous building designed by the architect Dwight Perkins. She graduated from that high school in the 1930s at the age of 16 because she skipped second and fifth grades at Bryn Mawr School in South Shore. Margie was a very, very bright woman, but if you go to the next slide, I'll show you what happened. Margie did not have a college degree, and she told me in 2014 that she only skipped grade levels because schools were overcrowded and they were trying to move certain pupils along. It was a terrible thing for her, and she told me as much. She said it was a horrible mistake that haunted me for the rest of my life. She said she could not get a scholarship to universities because they didn't want a 16-year-old. So without money for college, Margie started training as a dental assistant. She said, quote, I was talking to my dentist and he said, how would you like me to train you to be a chair assistant? And he said, I will pay you $6 a week. That was enough for me, she said. Boy, I accept. At that time, she said, we did not send things out to laboratories. We did them right here in our offices. So she told me she learned to make everything but full dentures. 
Now, she did take some courses. She took some free classes at the nearby University of Chicago. She was able to do that because she'd been a volunteer usher at the university's Mandel Hall. And while working at Mandel, she met her future husband, Luther Hamilton. He was a University of Chicago doctoral student. They married in 1934 when Margie was only 19 years old. Luther, her husband, uh, is not the subject of this talk, but he had a long career as a paper broker. He bought paper from mills and he'd sell paper to customers like magazine publishers. If you go to the next slide, Margie and her husband moved up to Barrington in the 1940s. And that was when she got her first taste of politics and she encountered some terrible discrimination. So you all know during World War II, Japanese Americans were discriminated against. Up in Barrington, the local park district barred Japanese American youngsters from using the local swimming pool because their parents' properties had been confiscated by the federal government. Margie told me, I just became infuriated at that because they were the same age as some of my kids and they were darling children. I protested and much to my amazement, I won. The Barrington District had to change. And because of my action, they let the children back into the swimming pool. That is the incident that started my interest in politics. So let's now move to Wheaton. If you go to the next slide. In 1950, they moved from Wheaton, Barrington to Wheaton, and they bought a house that some of you may be familiar with. It's the house at 829 North Wheaton Avenue. It's right there at the southeast corner of Wheaton Avenue and Harrison Street. They bought it from the Rinaldo family. If you go to the next slide, I'll explain what happened. Why would anyone move from Barrington to Wheaton, their comparable communities? It was entirely for family reasons. They had a growing family. They needed more space. They had four sons and her mother-in-law was living with them as well. She told me in 2014, they, they needed a larger house and they, she'd been told there were a lot of large old houses on the north side of Wheaton as there still are. She found one that fit them nicely. And so they settled in Wheaton. If you go to the next slide, Margie's first uh, really arrival in local politics was her forming the Wheaton chapter of the League of Women Voters. She provides an account of this on the League's website. But what happened was after moving to Wheaton in 1950, she was dismayed that there was no Wheaton chapter. So she joined the Glen Ellen chapter and she formed a study group with other Wheatonites in that chapter. There were a handful of them, maybe five or six. And the issues they focused on were park district funding, zoning, and inadequate storm sewers, including in the Hawthorne subdivision up on Wheaton's north side. So they soon decided to form the League's Wheaton chapter, which is helping to sponsor this talk tonight. One noteworthy point is that to this day, Wheaton continues to deal with inadequate storm sewers and flooding issues, including in, among other areas, the Hawthorne subdivision on the city's north side. And that Margie and other League organizers identified those above issues so early on really shows how prescient they were, but also it foreshadows how Margie would soon agitate for more professional management at City Hall. So if you go to the next slide. So here is a cover of a daily journal and uh, from 19, February of 1957, Margie, even though she was not yet an elected official, she started pushing for some changes to Wheaton's government. So in February of 1957, she hosted a League of Women Voters event at her home on North Wheaton Avenue that discussed what a new form of government for Wheaton might look like. Representatives from the Kiwanis, the Lions Club, the JCs, and even the city council attended this event. If you go to the next slide, so then she ran, decided to run for city council in 1959. This is fascinating. There were 17 original candidates running. So they held a primary in March of 1959 just to try to get the field winnowed down from 17 candidates down to eight. And Margie did very well. I mean, she, she got 1,321 votes and that was certainly good enough for her to make the cut. And then the following month in April of 1959, they had the, the final uh, election to elect both the mayor and four city council members. Since Margie was among the top four in the March primary, it wasn't a great surprise that she won uh, a full election as well. In those days, you didn't call city council members city councilmen and city council woman. You called them commissioners. And so, as I said, there were there's a mayor and there were four commissioners. So all four were on the ballot at the same time. And among her fellow commissioners was the highest vote getter by a mile, uh, Wallace Connolly. He had been on the Wheaton City Council since the 1930s. So that was for well over 20 years he'd been on the city council. 
Now, Margie was never one to hide her light under a bushel. She told you exactly what she thought. And she told me in 2014 that Wheaton at the time had, quote, that weird form of government at that time, where people just pointed at a council, a city commissioner, and said, you be the councilman, she meant commissioner, in charge of this. So there was a commissioner in charge of public works, commissioner in charge of streets, and so forth. So she said, and I quote, after the election, they would have a private meeting, and by a flip of a coin, they would decide what job you got. Nobody wanted to be commissioner of streets. The newspaper at the time was very, very conservative, and they said, well, that's ridiculous. A woman can't be commissioner of streets. So Margie then added, she said, and I said, to heck with that. A woman can be commissioner of streets if she wants to be. So I took that job, end quote. What was interesting about that is the commissioner of streets job was both a high visibility job, because what's something people complain a lot about, particularly in our climate, the condition of streets. Also, Wheaton streets weren't in particularly good shape in the 1950s. And so you ended up getting a lot of uh, grief. And so as a result, that was why the other commissioners weren't especially interested in being commissioner of streets. If you go to the next slide. So once Margie was elected, changes were afoot. So Margie and the League together continued pushing for a change in Wheaton's form of government. She didn't have any specific dissatisfaction with the members of the council. She just said, she told the Chicago Tribune in 1951 that commissioners just didn't have the time to manage uh, running city departments as well as they should be. So, and, and, and once she was elected, League of Women Voters members laid out the following problems in Wheaton's management. There was inadequate off-street parking in the downtown area. There was a need for more light industry in Wheaton to reduce tax rates. There was inadequate community planning. There were outmoded streets and there was poor street lighting. And the thing is, the League of Women Voters members were absolutely right. After World War II, with the advent of the automobile and less transit use, we just didn't have enough parking for downtown. It was a thriving, robust place where people to shop and eat. After the war, Wheaton also didn't have robust subdivision standards yet. So as a result, that's why a lot of neighborhoods in town were laid, that were laid out after World War II don't have streetlights or curbs or sidewalks or all of the above. And developers absolutely weren't required to guard against flooding by providing on-site stormwater detention as they are today. So clearly, greater management was needed. On top of that, there wasn't enough off-street parking in the downtown area, and Wheaton didn't have and still doesn't have much in the way of light industry, manufacturing, that kind of thing to reduce the tax base. If you go to the next slide. So the answer was a city manager. So uh, Wheaton voters in November of 1961 approved the city manager form of government. In 1962, Wheaton's first city manager was hired. Now he didn't last long. He left Wheaton early 1965. He had a deteriorating relationship with Wheaton's mayor at the time, Carl Heimke. That's not that unusual when towns convert from no city manager to city manager. And I personally have seen this happen in Oak Brook Terrace. It can take some time for the mayor to adapt to a changed role, for the council members to adapt to a changed role. And so it wasn't really surprising that Mr. Foote's role or his time in Wheaton wasn't long. After him, Robert Epley was named city manager. After that, there was Leonard Caro, William Kirchhoff, Don Rose had uh, the longest stretch of anyone I've ever run across as city manager anywhere. And then currently Mike Dugan as Wheaton city manager. But one can't see the city council vote and, and, and I'm sorry, the uh, city voters vote to create the city manager form of government as anything other than an un alloyed victory for Margie Hamilton and for the League of Women Voters. If you go to the next slide. Wheaton was growing and it needed more things and Margie really pushed for progress. So one of her great accomplishments was pushing for a new Wheaton Public Library. Wheaton voters overwhelmingly approved the new library through a tax increase that they signed off on in 1963. From there, construction began in 1964. You can see in the photo below, the new library was dedicated in Wheaton in 1965. Not all of the city's leaders supported the new library. The council was not all of one mind. Mayor Carl Heimke, he had favored keeping the library in the 1891 Adams Memorial Library building. Most of you know that over on East Wesley, that's where the Wheaton or the DuPage Historical Museum is now. If you go to the next slide. So Margie Hamilton also supported turning this. Do you all know what this is? This is the remnants of the Chicago Aurora Elgin Railroad after service ended. That's the bridge over what's now the Union Pacific Railroad tracks. You can see that these tracks are weed choked. That's because the line had discontinued operations. So she supported turning what you're looking at there, if you go to the next slide, into this 
we all recognize that as the Illinois Prairie Path, which to this day continues to use that exact same 1907 bridge structure over the three railroad tracks in downtown Wheaton. If you go to the next slide, back uh, after the Chicago Warren Elgin stopped operating in 1961, that right of way was in demand. It was sought after by Wheaton and by some of the other towns along its line, and it was sought after by DuPage County. So what did people want with it? Wheaton wanted the right of way for a number of things. The railroad had been headquartered in Wheaton and had a lot of land in Wheaton, but other communities wanted as well as it went through some of their downtowns as well. So DuPage County wanted to keep it all together as one in one uh, parcel of land. So while on the council, Margie Hamilton was part of a three to two vote approving what was a very creative solution to end some really complicated litigation between the city and the county. And it allowed the city, the county to get what it wanted, which was effectively a future nature trail, which became the prairie path, while giving Wheaton a variety of things that it wanted land for downtown parking, uh, right along the tracks there, land for commuter parking, and land for the Wheaton's public works facility. Once again, Margie Hamilton was at odds with Mayor Carl Heimke. He had favored condemning all of the railroad right away inside Wheaton's limits only. He was concerned that the county had uh, would, plant, would install a highway on the right of way. I don't know how realistic that was of a risk, uh, but I do know that getting the downtown parking lots made it a lot much less likelihood of there being a, a highway on that right of way. If you look along the Union Pacific tracks in downtown Wheaton, you see those parking lots right in downtown. There's not much space to punch a highway in between those parking lots and the Union Pacific Railroad tracks. And that was a real victory also, because again, in those post-war years, Wheaton needed more parking in downtown Wheaton. It certainly got that, plus more land for commuter parking and public works property as well. So Margie was responsible for all of this because on top of all of that, she helped uh, pave the way for the Illinois Prairie Path to come into being. It's obviously a tremendous asset to the community and it's something that uh, just attracts huge numbers of, of trail users, bikers, joggers, and, uh, and, and walkers. If you go to the next slide, so one sad casualty of the Prairie Path a deal involved the demolition of this attractive old Chicago Rural Elgin Depot at 101 East Liberty Drive in downtown Wheaton. It was designed by an architect named Horatio Wilson. It was built in 1911 and it came down in 1966. It is now one of those parking lots on the south side of the tracks. The land underneath that is now one of those parking lots. If you go to the next slide. So really the crowning achievement of Margie's time as a member of the city council before she became mayor involved Wheaton's fair housing law. So in the 1950s and 1960s, housing discrimination in Wheaton was real and it was literally written to the law. First off, there were no laws preventing sellers and real estate agents from discriminating against buyers of real estate. So in addition to discriminatory deeds, some subdivision plats actually contained hateful, abhorrent, and racist language. These plats remain freely available today. Anybody can look at these out of the recorder's office, and they continue to be used by land surveyors, developers, and lawyers. If you go to the next slide, this is a hard slide to look at. Okay. Note below the racist language from a 1944 subdivision plat that I'm pulling up as, as an example. The neighborhood is called Glenton Acres. If you all know where K Road is and Glencoe Street, these subdivision plat creating that neighborhood says point blank. You can read it uh, as just as plain as day on the screen. It is the express condition of this conveyance that no part of the real estate herein described shall ever be conveyed or leased to any person who is not Caucasian and shall never at any time be used or occupied by any person who is not a Caucasian. You can actually see, I, I just, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I excerpted it. It's a very wide text. So I deliberately cut it off on each end, but you can certainly see what that is. It is really hard to look at that. And it's hard to imagine that with that kind of of um, mindset in 1944, Margie was on the city council 15 years later. She was um, talking about this issue 22 years later. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see what happened next, which is that she started pushing for a fair housing law. Now, certainly in the mid 1960s, there were a number of civil rights uh, developments that had taken place, which had been great. There had been across the country, lots of change was underway. So there was real momentum to uh, eliminating discrimination in housing. And so by 1966, a fair housing law, again, which is one that would bar discrimination uh, by real estate agents and homeowners in the rental and sale of homes, it looked increasingly possible. 
So there's a peaceful demonstration in September of 1966, about 150 black and white civil rights demonstrators marched through Wheaton seeking passage of an open housing or fair housing ordinance. Claude Audley of Wheaton, he was the NAACP's chairman, he helped lead the march and the march terminated at City Hall where Margie Hamilton met, the, met those demonstrating as did Mayor Heimke, as did City Manager Bob Epley. Building owner and former Wheaton College professor Bill Volkman, known to many Wheaton College students as Doc Volkman, he owned a number of buildings. He owned the Four Seasons Motel in, on Roosevelt Road in Glen Ellen, but he owned a number of apartment buildings around the college. He told the Chicago Tribune Cell Yackley in 1967 that 13 of the 15 apartment buildings he owned were integrated. He said, quote, we started integrating buildings near Wheaton College four years ago. He, he told the Tribune, quote, black students at the school, including Africans, broke the ice for the community, end quote. So now if you go to the next slide. So led by Margie Hamilton, Wheaton's council voted four to one in 1967 to approve the fair housing law. Wheaton was one of the first communities in Illinois to pass a fair housing law. And I think it's really underappreciated today just how forward Wheaton was on that issue. So at the time, Wheaton had about 27,000 residents. Uh, I think you all probably know it has about 52,000 residents today. It had 27,000 residents, a little more than 400 of whom were Black. That made Wheaton the only community in DuPage County with a population more than 1% of which was Black. When I talked to Margie in 2014, she reflected on the law's enactment. She told me, quote, at that time, if you bought property any place in the Chicago area, you were handed a deed that this property cannot be sold to Jews or people of color. My husband and I both said that if we were ever in a position to change that, that's the first thing I'd do. And it, she, the, it, meaning Wheaton's housing law, was adopted a matter of months before President Johnson made it a federal law. So Margie Hamilton, she actually helped write Wheaton's fair housing law, along with Wheaton's then city attorneys, uh, the late Hartman Stein and C. William Pollard. Bill Pollard went on to teach and be an administrator at Wheaton College and then to run service master. If you go to the next slide. So what was neat to think about this is that Wheaton was actually ahead of Washington. As Margie Hamilton just noted, as I quoted a few moments ago, Wheaton passed its fair housing law in 1967. That was before the federal government enacted the Federal Fair Housing Act. If you look at the picture below, that's President Lyndon Johnson signing that bill into law in April of 1968. If you go to the next slide. So Margie Hamilton, another thing she supported was the city's 1965 acquisition of the building at 303 West Wesley Street. At the time, it had been rented to an insurance company. It had been owned by a foundation, and the city bought it to make it to City Hall. This building was built around 1933. Uh, this is a picture below us of it in 1965. It was dedicated in January of 1966 as City Hall. Wheaton's previous City Hall was very, very small. It was across the street on the site of what where they later built the police station, which is now also gone. But um, that new city hall, uh, I think everyone would agree, has worked very, very well over the past 55 years. If you go to the next slide. So some of Margie's other activities I want to touch on before we get to her running for mayor. In 1958, she and her husband moved from Wheaton's north side to its south side. They bought this ranch style house here at 251 East Park Avenue. That's just west of Naperville Road. She also was interested in, in uh, statewide politics. Margie ran unsuccessfully in 1968 for state representative to fill out a vacancy left by an Illinois state rep who had died in a car crash. If you go to the next slide. So then in December of 1968, Wheaton's mayor was revealed to be commuting between Wheaton and Kansas City. He was spending four days a week in Kansas City at a job that he had taken that was based in Kansas City. He was only staying in Wheaton on the weekends and then on Monday nights when this council meetings were held. Early Tuesday, he flew down to Kansas City and worked there for the rest of the week. There was a ton of negative publicity about this, and he initially claimed he wouldn't resign, but eventually, under pressure, Carl Heimke resigned as mayor in December of 1968 with more than two years left in his term. So that meant there would be a special election in April of 1969 to fill out the rest of his term. At that point, Margie Hamilton threw her hat in the ring. At the outset, she said, I'm not sure the community would accept a woman mayor, end quote. However, she added that there were so many people in the community urging her to run. Her opponent was Wheaton's postmaster at the time, Thomas Wood. The city attorney, however, ruled that under Illinois law, he, didn't, he interpreted it that this guy, Thomas Wood, could not serve as both mayor and as postmaster. Thomas Wood, however, he vowed not to resign as postmaster if he were to win. If you go to the next slide, 
He needn't have worried uh, because Margie Hamilton defeated Thomas Wood with 53.2% of the vote, 3,164 votes to 2,783 votes. That victory made her Wheaton's first female mayor. It made her the only woman heading a municipal government anywhere in the Chicago area. And to put it into some perspective here, Wheaton had a female mayor four years before Glen Ellen did and 10 years before Chicago did. So the Chicago Tribune reported in one article that Mrs. Hamilton, quote, attributed her success to a concentrated effort by a throng of housewife campaigners who worked in her behalf, end quote. That is not exactly the language that would be acceptable today. However, in a separate article, the Tribune quoted her as saying that she wasn't worried about how she'd be received as Wheaton's first female mayor. She'd been on the council for 10 years after all. And so she said, quote, I fought my battles a long time ago, and I would be awfully disappointed if I were treated differently, end quote. Another sign of those times is that in that second article that I just quoted from 1969, that article never once called her Margaret Hamilton. It instead referred to her only as Mrs. Luther Hamilton or as Mrs. Hamilton. If you go to the next slide. So as mayor, uh, one of the things Margie oversaw was a ton of subdivision approvals. So one of my favorite photos of Margie, this is her with Tom Shannon here, the late Tom Shannon. He was a developer who built the streams subdivision. She approved that, the first phase of the streams and, she also, and the Farnham subdivision, Tom Shannon built that as well. The two of them are sitting on a couch with a gigantic cake. That I, it's hard to describe how big that cake looks. As I look at it, I, I don't know how you could have even made a cake like that. But this cake is to commemorate and christen the, uh, the beginning of the streams development, which as everyone knows is a very nice and very, very large development on Wheaton's west side. If you go to the next slide, one of her major accomplishments was overseeing in December 1970, the Aurora Yards Project. That is known to most people as Wheaton Center. Some people colloquially call it Wheaton Towers. So it's, it's on about 15 acres. It had held the old Chicago Aurora and Elgin Railroad Yards. And it, ha it has two 20-story apartment buildings, some low-rise apartment buildings as well, and a parking garage. And it's attracted lots of critics over the years, both for its density and for its aesthetics. Obviously, most people have recognized that it's been repainted or, or painted really for the first time just in the past few years. In addition, because that project was federally financed, it drew critics who feared that it would mean low income housing. So while not, not everybody embraced Wheaton Center, it was unquestionably in keeping with Margie Hamilton's commitment to provide a range of housing options for people in Wheaton. If you go to the next slide, here is a picture of 19, from 1973 of Wheaton Center while the two 20-story buildings are under construction. The building in the foreground is, I think, about 14 stories completed at this point. I love this picture. If you go to the next slide, to be sure, not everything Margie Hamilton supported as mayor came to pass. One very controversial thing she supported and really pushed was a, a scattered site housing project for 156 low-income housing units on scattered sites throughout Wheaton, 100 of which would have been for elderly people, 56 of which would have been for low-income families. The administration of Ralph Bar Barger, which succeeded her, uh, Barger actually ran on that low income housing issue as an opponent of it. And when that election took place in 1971, he and a number of council candidates who, who held those exact same views, they all won. So as a result, it ensured that there was a majority to not support that housing plan and that housing plan was tabled indefinitely. Now, if you go to the next slide, and to be sure, I should make clear here, Margie Hamilton wasn't exactly sweetness and light. She was not a shrinking violet and she was opinionated and she was tough. Uh, and when I interviewed her in 2014, she was 99 years old, and she seemed sharp as a tack. It was 45 years after she had been elected, and she still hadn't lost much when it came to having harsh words and vitriol for those on the council uh, and who had opposed her, both when she was on the council and as mayor. She had very, very strong words, and she had very strong opinions, and I have no doubt that she, she uttered those while she was on the council as well. However, that strong personality also had to have helped her to get things done. It helped her to get things done in forming the League of Women Voters, and it had to have helped her on the city council. And it may even have been enough to persuade some council members to cross over and join her for some three to two votes. If you go to the next slide. There's one mystery. Were streets in Wheaton named after Margie Hamilton or not? Most of you probably know where the High Knob subdivision is. It's built along Orchard Road in the late 1960s and early 1970s on the site of the old W.P. Cowan Mansion, which you can see on the below right 
you can see the picture of it there. That stood until the late 1960s. It's a gorgeous house that was designed by Prairie style architect Robert Spencer, who was uh, very close to Frank Lloyd Wright. The late developer Robert Faganall, you see his picture there in below left, I talked to him in September of 2005, and he told me that he named three streets in High Knob all after Margie Hamilton, Hamilton Lane, Hamilton Drive, and Hamilton Court. Now, if you go to the next slide, however, uh, if he did indeed name the streets after her, he either was a fortune teller and knew she'd win as mayor, or he simply liked her a lot as just a council member. She was elected mayor on April 15th, 1969. But if you look at this plat in the lower left-hand corner, and then if you look in the lower right-hand corner, I've blown up the relevant part, you see that this plat containing all three street names was actually approved on April 9th of 1969 by the DuPage County Zoning and Platt Committee. So it was actually approved before she was elected mayor. So either he knew she'd win, or he just liked her a lot and he was honoring her even as a council member, and she may have lost the 1969 election for all he knew at the time. It's hard to know and it may not matter, but I do think it's worth pointing out the difference in timing on that. If you go to the next slide, you can actually see a picture. Hamilton Lane goes in one direction and Hamilton Drive goes in another direction. We'll never know the answer to this. I only discovered this in preparing this talk. Bob Faganall sadly died in 2015. If you go to the next slide. So Margaret decided in 1971 not to seek re-election to the council. She noted that her husband Luther would be retiring in a year or two. She wanted to be free to travel with him. She also said, quote, I also think it's good that this job be filled by someone with fresh ideas every so often. She said, without change, we would all stagnate. She, however, dismissed any idea that she was leaving politics behind. She called it ridiculous to assume that she'd be getting out of politics for good. She said, once it gets in your blood, it doesn't leave. If you go to the next slide. So after being mayor, just a few months after leaving office, so this was still in 1971, she helped found the DuPage County chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. She was elected the chapter's first chairperson. She'd been a member of the ACLU for 25 years, but DuPage County didn't have a chapter up until that point. It should be obvious, Margie liked to organize things. She liked to build and create things. However, very sadly, in 1972, Margie's husband suffered a stroke. Uh, and so the two of them decided to sell their house on Park Avenue, move to an apartment over on the east, east, southeast part of Wheaton at 1333 South Lorraine Road. She lived there on Lorraine Road until just a few years before she died when she re relocated to Chicago's south side to a senior living community. And her husband, Luther, died in 1977. She was only 62 at the time. If you go to the next slide, however, another career awaited Margie Hamilton. 1975, she took a job as the assistant to College of DuPage's associate dean. She then, for the next 11 years, held various clerical jobs. But in 1986, College of DuPage hired her to replace the departed director of College of DuPage's Older Adult Institute. Several years later, the enrollments, older folks seeking not really college credit earning, but maybe in some cases college credit earning, education, uh, those enrollments were mushrooming. So she said, quote, we have certainly learned that a high percentage of older adults want some kind of intellectual stimulation. That area had been neglected. She said political science, history, practically anything to do with the humanities are very popular. Memoir writing, too, she said. There's a picture of Margie in 1990. If you go to the next slide. So not too many people start a new career at age 71. And when she was given the job, she in 1986, she initially decided she'd take the job for six months and that she was really, she was ready to retire. However, we see what happened next. She loved the work, and for the next 22 years, Margie was quoted in the news media constantly. She created one senior educational and recreational initiative after another. She set up a coffee house for seniors at COD. She'd offer dances uh, at, you know, at events for College DuPage, older adults, but she also created class after class after class. She just very much expanded that program as well. She won awards left and right. In 1998, the Illinois Alliance for Aging named her a quote, an official Illinois treasure. And then in 2007, the nonprofit group Senior Home Sharing honored Margie with its Merit Grimm Award. That award honors a person whose work improves the lives of seniors. If you go to the next slide, and not too many people retired age 93. I thought about this as I was working on this. We all should be so lucky as to love doing something as much as Margie loved running COD's Older Adult Institute. If you go to the next slide. 
So I want to talk a little bit about her death and her legacy. Margie moved to the Montgomery Place retirement community in Chicago's East Park, Hyde Park area in 2011. So she left Wheaton at that point for the first time in 61 years, after 61 years of living in Wheaton. She died of natural causes there in 2019. Margaret Hamilton's tenure as Wheaton mayor was short, but she left quite an imprint on pol Wheaton's political scene during her 12 years on the council, including her two years as mayor. Margie Hamilton unquestionably paved the way for other women to serve on Wheaton City Council, inclu including Gwen Henry, who was mayor from 1990 until 1992, as well as other women who have served and continue to serve on the City Council, including Fran Culler, Linda Davenport, Linda Johnson, Suzanne Fitch, Erica Bray Parker, and Lynn Robin. Margie Hamilton also was the second Wheaton mayor to live to the century mark after William Gammon, who died in 1977 at age 100. I like to joke with other former mayors that, that this bodes well for their uh, future longevity. Tangibly, Margie Hamilton's handiwork can be seen all over the area. Think about it. Her work had a distinct impact on our area's education at College DuPage, on our area's transportation, the Prairie Path, on our area's government, the mayor manager form of government, plus acquiring a city hall that the city continues to use, on diversity in terms of the fair housing law, and more broadly on housing between Wheaton Center and residential subdivisions that were uh, approved on her watch, like Briarcliff, the Streams, and Farnham. It is no exaggeration to say that Margie Hamilton had a tremendous impact on Wheaton. If you go to the next slide, you can see a signature. This is Margie Hamilton's signature. And I'd like to say thank you all very much. And at this point, I'd be more than happy to open it up for any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Bob. Wow, what a remarkable woman. I We would love to see any questions you have. You can use the Q&A function. Um, we'll also be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, some wonderful comments and memories of, of Margaret as well. Um, let me see here. Stop sharing. Oh, here's a question. Um, I know that the counterfactuals are hard to answer, but do you think the prairie path would have happened without Mayor Hamilton? So that is a counterfactual, and that is a that is a absolutely that's a tough question. I think there was enough momentum that it probably would have. Yes, I mean the county wanted it really badly. It's hard to know how it would have ended up in court. Um, you never know what might happen in a court case. Um, but the Prairie Path's origin story is broadly shared about May Watts, this conservationist, sending a letter to the Chicago Tribune. Um, I think that. Uh, the, the real concern about making a prairie path happen was incursions into the right of way. And we've seen that happen with other abandoned rights of way where railroads have actually sold pieces of them, thus breaking up the right of way and making it hard to reconstruct them. In those cases, other trails, including the Great Western Trail, the old Chicago Great Western through Carroll Stream and North Glen Ellen, in those cases, the, the railroad actually sold some lots for land for single family homes. And that sort of thing would happen. In those cases, sometimes it has to be rerouted. A path has to be rerouted on public streets. I think that without that three to two vote, had that gone the other way, it would have landed in court. I think the prayer path would have taken longer to happen. And I do fear that in certain communities, it might have been an entirely on the sidewalks type path. So much of it is truly separated from roads, which makes it much safer. And let's be honest, more picturesque as well. But it's, it's striking that it was a three to two vote and she was on the prevailing side. So yes, counterfactuals are hard to know. Maybe the county would have won anyhow, but it is, uh, I certainly think that she made it much easier and, uh, and she made it happen much sooner for sure. And a next question, uh, do you know, uh, can you tell us about her sons? Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I, she, I've had four sons. I, the only one I've ever met is Dick. Um, and I confess, I didn't go much deeply into, into her sons. I, so I, 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 it's not an area of her life that I have a huge amount of detail on, I'm afraid. I wish I did. Uh, next question. Um, are there any monuments or awards that honor Margaret Hamilton? So 
That is a wonderful question. I would actually turn that over to the league to ask if the league has something honoring her because I, I actually think the league does, but I'm not positive. The city itself does not. The streets, obviously, you, it should be obvious to you all that I get a, a, a sort of a, an entertaining and nerdy uh, view about the streets. Um, but I don't know that the city has done anything beyond that specifically to honor her around town. I'd like to see, I, I would like to see something like that, but I never have. Agreed. I think that would be a wonderful thing to do. So, so those in the audience leaders, uh, keep keep that in mind. Um, next question: um, Why do you think other um, similar high rises like the Wheat Wheaton Center in here, Wheaton Towers, um, became popular in the western suburbs? Why do I think they did, or why do I think they didn't? Why they didn't? Because I I believe oh, oh, those sure. are the the top the are. highest ones yeah. in the western. They're, they're the tallest ones. Yeah, that, and that's correct. Um, I think uh, there's a there's a great deal of, of well a, a couple there are a couple of reasons. Um, what you've seen in the last probably 25 to 30 years, you've seen a lot of communities want to build up uh, Elmhurst, Arlington Heights, Des Plaines, and so. But when building up it hasn't really meant in most of these communities going up more than about 10 stories. Um, there's an enormous uh, pushback from residents of communities. It's different if you're, it's an office building in Schaumburg right along 355, but in a downtown, there's a view that candidly that high rise buildings are, are fairly unsightly in a suburban town. I, I'm amazed that Wheaton Center even was approved, to be honest. I, 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 what was neat about it was you had 15 acres very close to a downtown because it was under one common owner, a, a railroad. So you could put together, I wouldn't call it a mixed use development, but you could put together development with high rises and low rises. Um, the other neat thing is that they were able to get Wheaton a uh, parking deck uh, for commuters, which we really, really wanted. And so that was a helpful part of the development that I think made it happen. Um, but I think in general, there's a tremendous amount of pushback to the quote unquote eyesore aspect of something like that. And in fact, um, Ralph, Ralph Barger, who succeeded uh, Margie Hamilton, he had no use for Wheaton Center at all. I mean, he, he what he said after he took office was, we're stuck with this, he said. I mean, that was his reaction. So his reaction was not uh, an uncommon view across town. What's more, Ralph Barger and a number of his political allies really had control of city government then from 1971 until Gwen Henry was elected in 1990. So for really the next two decades, it was pretty clear that kind of development wouldn't happen again. What did start to happen, as everyone knows, in the 1990s is you did get some really attractive downtown redevelopments, but these are, we're talking four-story buildings, three-story and four-story buildings. Those are generally very well accepted. But I think the the um, sort of eyesore problem or the just uh, the aesthetic problem is a really hard one and I think has been a hard one for other towns to to go along with. Okay, and we uh, received a couple of questions about um, her faith, um, what her relationship was to Wheaton's faith community and um, if you knew that if she attended a local church, if so, which one? I, this is a great question. And I wish I had looked into this before I began. She certainly was not outspoken about it, um, but again, I would have to. I'd have to ask her son. I, that's not something I, I. I researched and working on this, and I'm sorry about that. I, I wish I had. And was she ever on the school board or involved in education in any way? No, really, the College of DuPage work was where she got most involved. Between that and the League of Women Voters, she was never on Wheaton's school board. And she didn't, you know, the, the public coverage of her didn't really involve a huge amount involving the, the Wheaton school board. And uh, another question about the Prairie Path. Um, since it runs beyond Wheaton, um, did its development begin in Wheaton or did Wheaton tie into the efforts with other communities? That's, that's a terrific question. Uh, May Watts, I think, was actually from Naperville, interestingly enough. I, I think I have that right. Um, no, I, I think um, a number of the communities wanted, oh, I see someone just said that in the chat that Margie was a Christian scientist. Thank you to Sharon Miller and Marianne Merrick for sharing that. I, I really appreciate that. I didn't know that. Um, no, I, the, it was a really a countywide effort. And the county continues to own that right of way to this day. Now, in some cases, um, some structures were actually um, 
Some structures from the railroad were kept up. Warrenville, uh, for a time, kept up its station. There's actually a station that uh, Wheaton Academy ended up buying. It was used for a time as a, as a model railroad club, and it's now a storage facility for Wheaton Academy. So there wasn't a, a thought that everything related to the railroad had to be demolished. Um, but it was really, DuPage County was the prime mover behind making this happen. Now, that said, DuPage County wanted to make it happen. They were very interested in the Illinois Prairie Path forming as a um, as a uh, as a not profit not for profit corporation to help fund its operations, but it is the underlying land is owned by the county, and the county's been pretty um, forceful about protecting you know the integrity of the boundaries of the Illinois Prairie Paths right of way. I, uh, I do see another comment in the chat, chat box from R Roberta Stewart, uh, who's an old friend. Roberta, thank you. R Roberta said she did work with the League of Women Voters to recruit candidates for uh, the school board. She said they did have a slate that they would present if Roberta recalls correctly, and I have no doubt that Roberta recalls correctly. So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, Margie was very politically active and was very interested, and her actions in the League, uh, I think, certainly showed that. Just in terms of her own personal activities, she was really interested in the, in the city government in terms of her direct involvement in terms of, you know, committing to electoral politics herself. Yeah, and I see in the chat, thanks, Judy, um, for those who didn't see that the League of Women Voters of Wheaton uh, did establish its service to the Wheaton League of Women Voters Award, and the name of the award is the Margaret Hamilton Award. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, one uh, person is wondering if you could tell us more about William Volkman, um, about the protest that he led. Uh, such an amazing story. Uh, what was it? It was actually Claude Audley who uh, oh. led the protest. I'm sorry. No, no, William Volkman was a building owner uh, in Wheaton. I, and I, I wrote his obituary for the Chicago Tribune. He died about five years ago. Claude Audley um, was, the, was the head of the NAACP. And he he led the, the protest. It was they, they took great pain, pains to point out that it was a peaceful protest. It was not designed as anything design, you know, to produce any sort of violence at all. Um, but my understanding was uh, you had, uh, as with the passage of the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s, you just had a growing belief that uh, Wheaton needed something. And, and, and this was, there was growing momentum for this at the federal level as well. And so it was a nationwide thing. But what hadn't happened was there hadn't been a huge amount of co communities taking a dip in the water. Um, and there were reasons for that. I mean, there were there were some, um, and you would call this these racist views today, but there were some who felt that real estate agents and homeowners shouldn't be bound. They should be allowed to sell who they want to. That is abhorrent and wrong, but you had that pushback. And as we certainly know, it can be hard to pass federal laws. And so I think activists saw local communities as a great place to start. Um, and so that was really, um, it was, it was a, a neat thing that this was 1966. So it was before some other protests that happened later in the 1960s. I don't have a huge amount of details about the path of the protests, unfortunately. I would have gotten more, I would say the, um, I've had difficulty getting access to the library's microfilm only because of the, with the pandemic, it's not the same now as it was beforehand. So, uh, but I would love to, to know more about what the path was, who started it and organized it. Claude Audley is someone I, I actually, um, many years later had the opportunity to get to know, but it certainly was, I, I, I think it was a neat thing that it was an integrated group of marchers. And I have no doubt Margie was well plugged in with them. So she was there to meet with them. Um, and in the end, you know, I, I feel like this talk takes a few shots at Carl Heimke, the mayor, but I should note he did end up voting in favor of, of the fair housing ordinance as well as the, the, the fair, the one who voted against it was Wallace Conley. Uh, we had a couple questions about um, any threats or, or hate speech um, that her and her family had to deal with because of her progressive positions. Um, that, that someone read that they um, she faced death threats um, from the F, like the FBI had to investigate because of her views and position on fair housing. Did she uh, share anything about that with you? Unfortunately, she didn't with me, and I regrettably didn't ask her that. Uh, I wish her son, uh, I could, I had him here right now to talk to him about it. I, I, I see him in the, he's, he is one of the attendees of the chat, but I, it is something I would absolutely believe. Uh, but no, it's funny that I, I, I don't know that that was the kind of thing that she would allow to be made public in the newspapers at that time. Certainly she would, um, 
uh, she would be open to talking about it. I think if I'd asked her, I didn't think to ask her, um, but I have no doubt that she encountered. Uh, usually, agents of change uh, don't don't. Uh, it's not all hunky dory, and so. Um, she had told people that she she needed to get FBI protection. Marianne Mirick is mentioning this in the chat. And I, I entirely believe that. I just don't have any specific details on what the threats looked like. The um yeah, yeah. The one thing, the only, yeah, th that those are all the details I have, but it, it would seem more than uh, I mean, I think too much change too fast can be jarring for existing establishments. And I have no doubt that she drew more than her share of unpleasant comments, threats, and, you know, all kinds, all, all of that, actually. I think it's really a credit to her that she stuck with it for 12 years. Uh, do you know, off the top of your head, did other, the other suburban communities adopt fair housing following Wheaton's model? They did. They did. I mean, at some point, it didn't matter because the federal fair housing law was enacted the following year. But yes, yes, then it was like dominoes. One community after another began enacting. it. So it was, Wheaton was one of the first. Wheaton was not the first in Illinois. I've, some have said Wheaton was the first, but now I, I know of at least one suburban community that was ahead of Wheaton. But I also know Wheaton was very early. And then yes, it became a domino-like thing. And I think it became obvious too that um, that the federal government was going to pass this law as well. Here's an interesting question. How do you feel, how did she tend to reflect on her career when you talked to her? Did she see herself as part of the national women's rights movement at the time? You know, it's funny. Uh, she didn't actually uh, talk about it in sort of national terms, or she didn't even really necessarily call herself a change maker. Um, I mean, I, I call her that, uh, but she didn't, use those kinds of words. I guess if I can say it another way, she wasn't especially um, self-important um, or or just, or full of herself. Like when she talked about her achievements, and again, I was talking to a woman in her 90s, but uh, she was still spunky and still a spitfire. But no, she, she didn't talk about herself like, yeah, I really brought to Wheaton what was going on elsewhere in the country. She didn't talk about it like that. I mean, she very much talked about it as a local effort and a local initiative. She didn't say, hey, you know, I was trying to, you know, put together a model that other communities could adopt, or I was trying to bring best practices from other communities here. It was really just, you know, she, she didn't seem particularly afraid of anyone else. She certainly didn't have a high opinion of some of the other people she had to work with, and she made that very clear. But she also, um, I think she thought her views and her work was, those things were right. She really had a, had a strong belief in the rectitude of what she was doing. But no, she didn't tie, that's a wonderful question. She didn't tie it to any broader movement, at least not when I spoke with her. Uh, there was a comment earlier that we would love to see Margie Margie honored around town, such an amazing woman and um, you know, all of her accomplishments, so, so agreed. Um, another question, um, what do you think kept her from getting industry into Wheaton? That is a wonderful question. And unfortunately, um, I, have, I have asked that question many times. Um, I, I would say it's a couple of things. Um, Wheaton has a, a couple of very small manufacturing districts. You all know where they are. There's one west of downtown, just north of the tracks. There's one west of downtown, just south of the tracks. That's about it. Um, Wheaton wasn't fully built out in 1969, but unfortunately, the areas close to downtown were fully built out. Now, that's not stopping anything from happening on the north end of town or the south end of town. Um, but a couple of things happened that really hurt Wheaton. Wheaton never was able to annex across the Rice property, which is now the Donata Forest Preserve. So Wheaton never had areas near what's near the tollway, like Bell Labs. Those were never in play. And then areas in Carroll Stream, there's a lot of industry in Carroll Stream. Wheaton never uh, had sort of an expansionist mindset to annex up that way. Now, you know, there, is, there are apocryphal stories out there that she uh, was not in favor of doing that. I, I can't speak to that because by the 1960s, Carol Stream was already incorporated anyhow. So it, it seems like those were decisions that should have been made, you know, 25 years before Margie came, came on the scene. But I think it's really hard when you have a lot of houses and a lot of places to shoehorn in 
manufacturing, you know, manufacturing and uh, factories and just light industrial activity. People don't like it and they don't want it. Carol Stream has done a great job of diversifying its tax base by setting that whole area to, to the east of Geary Avenue uh, and north of North Avenue aside, and it's, it's massive. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, it, it would have been nice to have seen something more industrial-like take place uh, as part of Donata, but that's just, that was not uh, to be for a couple of reasons. One is when Donata came along, there was a view that you needed a certain amount of housing, single families, certain amount of apartments as transitional. And then there would, there would be some office, particularly on West Loop Road. In the end, there wasn't a mar really a market for it. And so that's how the Vinings apartment complex ended up getting built. The bottom line is there really was no place for it in Donata either. So Wheaton, the way it was planned, it wasn't really a planned community that set aside meaningful areas. And I think she inherited some of that. I'm not sure she did anything to make that happen, but it would be nice to have seen some more of that. And I, you know, we're completely landlocked now. There's nothing we can do now. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not sure if we have the answer to this, but did you know if her sons uh, followed in her footsteps and Peru pursued a career in politics? I, I don't. I'm not aware of them having done so. But again, I, I should. I wish I'd asked Dick that before I, when I was working on this talk. But I, I don't believe so. Certainly not in Wheaton. They didn't. And um, some members of the league are saying in the chat that um, May May twentieth on uh, the League of Women Voters are going to have a ceremony um, in Adams Park to dedicate a tree in Margaret Hamilton's honor. So uh, stay tuned for more information about that. That's that's really really awesome. And I think uh, our last question, I think the answer to this is no, is um, evidence in your in your presentation on her houses in Wheaton. But um, I lived in the High Knob subdivision for 45 years. My last name is uh, Hamilton. All the streets are named Hamilton, caused much confusion. We moved in. We were told that uh, Margaret Hamilton lived on the estate at the top of the hill called High Knob. Is this true? I think it's that not. That is absolutely not <laughs> true. No, but if, if that person would like to get in touch with me, I would love to talk more about that estate. I, I've done a lot of research on that. I like houses and I like architecture. So I'd be more than happy to talk more about that. But no, she, neither she nor any family member nor any Hamilton ever lived in that estate. Uh, but thank, thank you all for the wonderful questions. I think that's a great place to stop when we hit the hour mark. Um, thank you so much, Bob, for bringing Margaret Hamilton to life for, for those of us who didn't know that much about her. And what a, one, what, a, what a wonderful life she led and so much she did for the city of Wheaton. I mean, this has just been amazing. And thank you so much to the Community Relations Commission and the League of Women Voters of Wheaton for partnering with uh, the Wheaton Public Library on this wonderful program. So, so yeah, share this uh, presentation with your friends who were unable to make it tonight to learn more about um, the, the legacy of Margaret Hamilton. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming tonight, everyone, and, and have a wonderful night.